There are gifts of the Holy Spirit that God has given to you to minister personally to an individual. And then there are gifts that God has given specifically to the church, to the body of Christ as a whole, to minister to people corporately. I'm continuing my series, The Gifts of the Holy Spirit, and on this edition of Spirit Church, I'll be talking about leadership gifts. These gifts include the gift of the pastor, the evangelist, the teacher, the prophet, and the apostle. Now, many of you watching this are called to these ministries, and I believe that as you hear the word, that there's gonna be something inside of you that sparks. I remember when I first started hearing about the gift of the evangelist and the gift of healing and the gift of teaching, there was like a pool in my spirit. I, I felt literally drawn in by what was being said. And I know that that's going to happen to some of you on this edition of Spirit Church. But before we get into this lesson and continue this series, Stephen Makazuma is here to do some worship. I want you to worship the Lord, prepare your heart for this word, and then we're going to get right into it. Here is Stephen Makazuma. You gave it all for me. My soul desire my everything And all I am is devoted to you and How could I fail to see That you are the love that rescue me and all I am is devoted to you and oh how could I not be moved Lord here with you so have your way in me Lord, there is just one thing that I will see, and this is my cry, it's my one desire, is to be where you are, Lord, now and forever, it's more than a soul, it's my one desire. It's to be with you, it's to be with you, and this is my cry, it's my one desire, it's to be where you are, Lord, now and forever, it's more than a song, it's my one desire, it's to be with you. It's to be with you, Jesus. So the gifts of the Holy Spirit, I broke down for you in separate categories on the last edition of Spirit Church, which was the introduction to this series. I talked about the service gifts, and I also mentioned that all gifts are for service, but for the sake of categorization, I use the term service for that first category. Then there are the power gifts, and then there are the leadership gifts. On this edition of Spirit Church, I'll be focusing on the leadership gifts, and then next week I'm going to talk to you about the power gifts, and then in part four of this series, I'm gonna to talk to you about how you can discover your spiritual gifts while also at the same time going over what the service gifts are. But I want you to go to Ephesians chapter four, verse number one, and I want you to pay close attention to what's being said here because you're going to notice that just like the context that we read last week, there is a great emphasis being placed on unity within the body of Christ. Wherever you find the gifts being mentioned, you will find somewhere in the context, for the most part, unity being emphasized. So Ephesians chapter 4, beginning at verse 1, says this, Therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. For you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, 
binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father who is over all and in all, living through all. However, He has given each one of us a special gift to the generosity of Christ. That is why the scriptures say, when He ascended to the heights, He led a crowd of captives and gave gifts to His people. Notice that it says He ascended this very clearly, or this clearly means that Christ also descended to our lowly world. And the same one who descended is the one who ascended higher than all the heavens, so that He might fill the entire universe with Himself. Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. So these are the gifts that Jesus gave to the church. Now remember, there are gifts that God has given to us that we use to personally minister one-on-one -on -one to an individual. All gifts are given so that we can serve one another, except for the gift of tongues, which can not only serve others, but also serve self. But I'll talk about that a little bit next week. But here he's talking about gifts that are given corporately to the body of Christ as a whole. And so we go on to read what these gifts are. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do His work and build up the church, the body of Christ. Now some will say, well, Brother David, I don't believe that prophets exist anymore. I don't believe that apostles exist anymore. For some reason, they believe in the teacher, the pastor, and the evangelist, but they don't necessarily believe in the apostles and the prophets anymore. But the scripture says very clearly in verse 13, this will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. In other words, these gifts are going to be in operation until every believer measures up to his or her full potential in Christ. Now, that has not happened yet. Therefore, these gifts are still in operation. So I want to look at number one, the first gift, the pastor. Now, the pastor is very key. The pastor is the one who counsels the individual, who guides the individual, who is the spiritual shepherd, as the scripture gives as an analogy of the people. The scripture tells us in Acts chapter 20, verse 28, and this is Paul the Apostle talking to the Ephesian elders, and this was actually his last time seeing these specific elders. The scripture says in Acts chapter 20, verse 28, So guard yourselves and God's people. Feed and shepherd God's flock, His church purchased with His own blood, over which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as leaders. Now again, Paul the Apostle is telling this to the Ephesian elders, and this was his last time talking to them. After this, he went and he knew he would suffer many things. He knew he would go to prison. And this was the last time he would speak with them. And this is what he emphasizes, or one of the things that he emphasizes. He tells them to guard themselves and God's people. He tells them to act as shepherds. Some of you are called to pastor God's people. You're called to watch as a shepherd over God's people. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17 makes reference to this type of spiritual leadership when it says, Obey your spiritual leaders and do what they say. Their work is to watch over your souls, and they are accountable to God. Give them reason to do this with joy and not with sorrow. That would certainly not be for your benefit. Now, having grown up as a pastor's kid, I've seen how people can treat pastors. People can be very mean, very cynical, very self-centered, and to be honest with you, very weird. There are certain techniques that they have. In fact, I would say this to pastors. If someone ever comes up to you in your church and they say to you, Oh man, I left my other church because my pastor hurt me. That's a red flag. In other words, they're setting you up for what they're going to try to do with control. They try to control with emotions. They try to control with manipulation. They try to control by getting you to feel sorry for them or by getting you to feel like you're not a good pastor for doing exactly what they're re requiring of you themselves or what they're asking or what they think they require of you. 
So a pastor is not someone who is to bend to the whim of every member of the congregation. A pastor is simply one who guides the people, who watches over the people, who stewards God's church. And you can be called to be a pastor. Perhaps you're watching this, and as I'm talking, you feel like this fire inside of you. You say, I know I'm called to pastor the people. Now, what's interesting, and I'll make this same point once, and you can also apply it to when I talk about teachers. But if you go back to Ephesians chapter 4, and if you look in verse number 11, the scripture says, and the pastors and teachers. It lumps them together. The pastor and the teacher have a very similar task in that they are continually investing into the individual. The pastor does not come and go. The pastor is a fixture in the spirit. The pastor is someone who is faithful, who is consistently there for the people of God. Now remember, we do not rely upon man for our spiritual well-being, necessarily. But God has placed pastors in our lives to bring guidance, to bring correction, and to bring counsel and comfort when we need it. So pastors are a good gauge that God has given to us. I myself have a pastor to whom I am submitted, happily submitted. Some of us think that submission equals bondage, but submission is total freedom in Christ. When I submit to God and His commands, I find freedom. When I submit to God's authority in the earth, I find freedom. Some of us are so bothered by the idea that we can be told what to do, that we forsake the assembling of ourselves together. We forsake the church. We forsake the leadership that God has given to us as a gift, not as a punishment, not as a curse. God has given to you a pastor as a gift. Now, I understand there are some pastors who abuse this power. Believe me, I've seen that. But this doesn't mean that we are to throw away what Christ has desired to give to us. Let me ask you this. Why would you want to receive any less than all for which Christ died to give you? If He died so that you can have it, you should take it. It's a gift He's giving to you. So, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1-4 through 4 say, Therefore I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ, and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily. In other words, not because you do it begrudgingly, not because you feel forced, but because out of your heart, the sense of the call of God within you, you steward what God has given to you. You shepherd the people, not out of feeling forced, but out of feeling passionate. And again, we don't always go based on feelings, but he's just making a point that there should be this desire to do what God has called you to do, not out of compulsion. According to the will of God, and not for sordid gain. In other words, not for greed, not for money, but with eagerness. In other words, this is something you're eager for. You want to do this. Verse 3, Nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. In other words, you lead not by control, but by character. You lead not by oppression, but by example. And so he's saying you're not to lord over them. You're not to oppress them. You're not to control them. And I've seen some pastors try to do that. They get very manipulative because they're so concerned about their numbers that they will say anything to keep people in those seats. When really, pastor, let me just give it to you straight. They're not your people. They're God's people. And the moment you recognize that they are God's people, you'll become a better pastor. Verse 4 says, And when the chief shepherd appears you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Pastors, you've been giving a, given a responsibility to shepherd over people. Now, I want to go back and emphasize here to Hebrew, on Hebrews 13, 17. I was talking about how I've seen people treat pastors, and I wanted to quickly go over about pastoral leadership and the role there. And I talked about how it's important that pastors don't become controlling. But now I want to go back to that verse and pull another point out, namely that God wants you to be submitted and not make it difficult for your leaders. Not make it hard on them. Why? Because that's not beneficial for you. God is the one who placed the pastor in your life. And therefore, because it is a gift from God, it is good for me. The pastor will challenge you in the deepest places of your soul. A good pastor. 
Now, of course, God, God, God has to give you discernment and you have to be led by the Spirit. You have to watch for signs of control. But just because a pastor tells you something you don't want to hear doesn't mean he's not a good pastor. Just because a pastor tells you something you don't like or that offends you doesn't mean that she is not a good pastor. You need to understand that the pastor will challenge you in ways that you don't want to be challenged. I know this personally. I have certain men of God in my life who, whether or not I agree with them, if they are insisting that I do something a certain way, I will do it the way they insist. And the scripture says they're accountable to God for it. It says it right there on Hebrews 13, 17. They're accountable to God for it. So in other words, God says, because you honor my authority in the earth, I'm going to hold them responsible for the results. And again, we have to balance this by watching out for the controlling pastor. But ultimately, I would say that you know a controlling pastor when they are more motivated by their power than they are their love for you. And you can't just throw that out there because you don't like what you're being told. I've seen some people say, well, he wasn't a good pastor when really he was. So you got to check your own heart. And really, I think deep down in the conscience, you know whether or not you're being rebellious. So find a good pastor. And those of you who feel called to pastor, make sure you're not lording over the people, but instead with gratitude for the position that God has given to you. And not out of compulsion, but out of eagerness, out of great desire, out of passion, shepherd the flock. I'm thankful for my pastors, and I'm thankful for the gift of the pastors to the church. Okay, number two, the apostle. Now, the apostle, very simple. That word in the original language simply means one sent on a mission. And I can go on reading various texts about all the apostles, and there are many of them. But one of the things you'll see with the apostles is that they were, they were called to begin certain works. So in the practice, they established churches and ministries prolifically. So Paul the Apostle established that we know of, recorded in Scripture, at least 14 churches. Now, probably many more and many more indirectly because he had Titus, he had Timothy, and many others who he would impart into, and then they would go and begin works. So the apostle begins new works. The, the apostle doesn't just establish programs or buildings or organizations. The apostle is a disciple maker. The apostle is a church planter. That would be the definition I'd give to you of an apostle. An apostle is a church planting disciple maker. One who multiplies the work of God through investment in relationship and people and helping them to become leaders. So a pastor will help the sheep. A pastor will help someone become a leader. But an apostle will help someone become a father. In other words, the apostle establishes works. The apostle founds churches. The apostle begins ministries. They would go from city to city, town to town. They would start a work raise a leader, put that leader in place, and then they would go on to the next city or the next assignment that God had for them. That is the truest definition of an apostle. An apostle is not necessarily a pastor of pastors, but an apostle is one, as I said, who can establish a work, put a leader in that place, and it just so happens that they become a pastor of pastors doing what they do. So an apostle is not someone who creates a pyramid scheme and ordains a bunch of people under them and calls themselves apostle. An apostle is not someone who's the head of an organization with multiple churches in it. An apostle is someone who can begin a work, disciple someone to take over that work, and then go do it again and again and again. That is the true gift of the apostle. It's not just a hierarchy of someone who's above a pastor, because I, I see many people use that term apostle because they don't want to be known as just a pastor. They want to have this title out of ego. They well, I'm not just a pastor. I'm an apostle. I'm a pastor of pastors. And that may be so. Some use that title appropriately, and others use that title out of the flesh. They just want attention for themselves. So be careful. If you feel called by God to be an apostle, let others say that about you. Don't go around saying, I'm an apostle, or I want to be an apostle. You're an apostle when God uses you to build a work, raise a disciple and take over that work and then go begin another. That is the true apostolic ministry. In fact, Paul the apostle was an apostle to the Gentiles. 
He began the work of the gospel in a new, not region necessarily, but among a new group of people. Many of the disciples of Jesus, the apostles, went on to found churches in various parts of the world, in Asia and all over. And these apostles would go and establish works and then continue to establish more works. So that's number two, the apostle once sent on a mission. This is a church planting disciple maker. Number three, the teacher. Some people are gifted by the Lord at making sense of spiritual truths. That's by the Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is the greatest teacher of the Scripture in the earth today. Romans chapter 12, verse 7 says, If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you are a teacher, teach well. Now, a good teacher is not someone who takes the Word of God and just says all of these fancy things and uses the Greek and Hebrew words. And there's nothing wrong with that. I, I do it all the time using Greek and Hebrew. And in other words, a teacher is not expounding. A teacher is not speaking to impress. A teacher is speaking to impart. The teacher is speaking not to make a name for himself or herself. The teacher is speaking to build the believer. A teacher will take complex ideas and present them as simple truths. A poor teacher will do just the opposite. They'll take something simple and they'll complicate it. Have you ever been listening to someone minister the Word of God and they say it in such a way, it's so well organized, it's so well presented that things just start clicking and you go, now I really understand it. That's the gift of the teacher. James chapter 3 verse 1 says, Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church. For we who teach will be judged more strictly. I want you to think about this. Though. These are those who handle the word of God and teach people how to think about the Bible. I want you to really think about what, how heavy that responsibility is. How weighty that truly is. That someone would take the word of God, the living word, the truth that God has presented to man, and teach people what it says. If you get too far off, it's heresy. This is why you have to be grounded in the Word. You have to be a student of the Word. If you're someone who enjoys the Word and enjoys explaining the Word, that's probably the gift of the teacher in you. You're someone who can take complex ideas and present them as simple, applicable, bite-sized truths. You're a teacher. But be careful not to enter it into too soon lest you become judged more strictly. We are held to a higher standard because we teach the Word of God. So make sure you know the Word. I was just today, earlier today, I had, um, you all know, Steve Moctezuma was over, and I was showing him some of the techniques I use for finding truths. And I was showing him some of the, the tools that I use, some of the study methods. What I will do is I will look at a book, I will look at the summary, of that book, I will study and find out what is the historical context of the book? Who was the letter written to if it's a letter? Why was the narrative written if it's a narrative? What's the account for if it's an account? And I, just, I look at the scripture and I find out where is the context? Why was it written? Who wrote it? What was the purpose of the, the letter even going out? And then after I understand the book as a whole from that synopsis or from that study, I'll go chapter by chapter, verse by verse, then word by word, and then go back and do it all again just to make sure I have the full and proper understanding because what can happen is when you're teaching the word, you may find a sentence or two that sounds like it says one thing, but it's really not talking about what you think it is. For example, the book of Luke talks about the Holy Spirit or the baptism of the Holy Spirit in a much different way than Paul the Apostle talks about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So you have to understand these, the way they talk about the Holy Spirit are two, uh, they're coming from two different understandings. So if you're not careful and you're comparing Luke with the writings of Paul the Apostle, you may get mixed ideas and it can become confusing. That's just one example. But my point is that there are details that you need to know. There are standards that you need to hold yourself to. If you are not in the Word every single day, be careful. If you are not studying this Word 
and truly trying to understand what's being said. Be careful. There are those of you who are called to be teachers. Teach well, the Bible says, not teach poorly. In other words, let the gift shine. Do your absolute best. This is the Word of God. It deserves to be presented with excellence. So that's the gift of the teacher. Number four, the gift of the evangelist. Let me tell you what an evangelist is not. An evangelist is not a traveling preacher. In our culture today, especially in America, I don't know about the rest of you in the world, but here in America, there's this idea of the evangelist that is just so far gone from what the scripture actually teaches. Many believe that the evangelist is the one who goes from church to church, hypes up the church, and then goes on to the next one. That is not at all what the scripture describes as the gift of the evangelist. Now, sure, the evangelist does travel from church to church, and that's included in his gift. But so often I see traveling evangelists travel when in fact they're actually traveling teachers. They minister to the body. They teach the word to the believer. But the evangelist is one who wins souls, plain and simple. The evangelist is one who's been so gifted by God. They've been graced with a distinct ability and anointing to win the loss to Jesus. Now, this doesn't mean that other believers cannot do the same. Just as other believers can teach, other believers can counsel, other believers can help begin new ministry works, and as you'll find, other believers can even prophesy. But these are office gifts. These are corporate gifts. These have to do with the touching of the entire body as a whole. These have to do with gifts of leadership, and this is a different realm of the gift. So it's one thing to evangelize. It's another thing to be an evangelist. It's one thing to prophesy. It's another thing to be a prophet. It's one thing to teach. It's another thing to be a teacher. It's one thing to give counsel. It's another thing to be a pastor. It's one thing to help found a ministry. It's another thing to be an apostle. So while we all have the obligation or the commission given to us by the Lord to evangelize the lost, not all of us are called to fit in the office of the evangelist in that our entire purpose of ministry in the body is to primarily go and win the lost and bring them into the church. So if you're asking me, that's my primary gift is the gift of the evangelist. I win souls. Second is teacher. Now to know what you are, you have to also admit what you're not. I know some people who are so enthusiastic about the gifts, they say, well, I want all of them. I would like for people to think that I have all of them and therefore I'm going around claiming that I have all of them, but that's not the case. I'll tell you right now, I'm not a prophet. I am not a pastor. Trust me, I'm not a pastor. I'm not an apostle. I am an evangelist with a teaching gift. And I focus in that way. Many of you who watch this channel, often you, you'll see that the miracle services, I pair the gift of teaching and the gift of healing with the gift of the evangelist, and that's what creates the ministry. It's that unique blend that brings about our ministry. And many people have different combinations of the gifts, and they also have different combinations of the gifts with the different personalities that God has given to them, and that creates all of these unique and wonderful ministries. So you have gifts that God has given to you. But the evangelist, I must emphasize here again, is not just someone who goes around entertaining people. Let's look at the scripture. We have a mention of an evangelist here in Acts chapter 21, verse 8. The next day, we went on to Caesarea and stayed at the home of Philip the Evangelist, one of the seven men who had been chosen to distribute food. So here we see a mention of the evangelist. So let's take a look at what Philip did. Acts chapter four, verse Acts chapter eight, excuse me, verses four through six says, But the believers who were scattered preached the good news about Jesus wherever they went. Philip, remember he's the evangelist, for example, went to the city of Samaria and told the people there about the Messiah. Crowds listened intently to Philip because they were eager to hear his message and see the miraculous signs he did. There's the evangelist. We go from city to city talking about the Savior, the Messiah. The message was the gospel. People would gather for what? Two reasons, to hear the message and see the miracles. Acts chapter 8, verse 40. Meanwhile, Philip found himself farther north at the town of of Azotus. He preached the good news there and in every town along the way until he came to Caesarea. So here we see Philip the Evangelist is going from town to town proclaiming the gospel 
and performing the miracles to back the gospel message. So the evangelist is one who goes to win souls. And that's that. You see, when I was growing up, I actually attended a private Baptist Christian school. I got much of my study methodology. I learned a lot of scripture from the Baptist teaching that I received. So I was trained biblically by Baptist also at the home church that I went to. So I attended a charismatic Pentecostal church pastored by my father and who is now currently my pastor. They were co-pastors and they and their wives were co-pastors. And then at school, I received biblical training from the Baptists. So I had a very unique blend by being trained by Baptist and charismatics at the same time. So Monday through Friday for about 45 minutes, we had Bible class every morning. And then I would go to church Wednesdays and Sundays. And that unique blend is what created some of the teaching that you hear today, the balanced approach. Um, but I would go in there into that school. We would have history books and these were Christian history books. Now get this, in our history books, you would actually see mapped out for you on the timeline, not only Jesus and creation, but you would see the, the mapped out the history of the church. So you saw evangelists and pastors and so, so forth. And I remember in school reading about George Whitfield and Billy Sunday, and even in our history books was Billy Graham. And as I read about these people and I looked on the history books and I saw pictures, old black and white photos of thousands of people gathered getting saved, there was like a fire lit in me. And I said, Lord, that's what I want to do. I want to win people. I want to win their souls. And, and I want to point them to you, Jesus. And that is where I first began to recognize there was the gift of the evangelist on my life. You see, we have conferences. I mean, you look around, conferences are everywhere. Conference this, conference that, impartation this, impartation that. And there's nothing wrong with it. I do impartation services every now and then. They're very small gatherings of maybe one or 200 people where I can really get in and teach and and we're going to be doing more of those soon on a weekly basis after we finish up our fundraiser, which I'll talk to you at the end of this program about. But we have conferences for believers. We have impartation services. And that's great that the believers all get together and encourage one another. That is supposed to happen. But you know what's missing nowadays? And I think I, think I only see, I don't see that many. I know Greg Glory, Pastor Greg Glory, who's a powerful man of God. He is doing evangelistic services. So there's power at those services, and, and we're thankful for ministries like Great Glory, but you don't see a lot of that today. You don't see a lot of evangelistic events taking place. In fact, we have evangelism and weirdness. So sometimes you'll go to an evangelistic service, and they'll try to win the lost, and it just, they just get really weird and carried away with charismatic gifts and all that. And again, I'm charismatic, but charismatics can get weird. And so, you know, they get carried away on that. And then we have evangelism, but there's no power. There are no miracles taking place. We need to present the simple, true, balanced gospel backed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Rarely do we see that nowadays. And I long for the return of those days. In fact, we're seeing it now in our ministry, and I'm so excited about that. But that, number four, is the gift of the evangelist. You, you knew I'd have more to say about that gift than any other. You should have at least expected that. Finally, number five, and I'll finish up on this point. The prophet. Now I'm talking about the true prophets of God, not the people who get up and people read. In fact, let me give you this warning now. I'm going to give this to you because I care about your soul and I care about your walk with the Lord. So I'm not going to mention any names, okay? But I just, I have to be real with you. I have to just share this with you. There are so-called prophets today who will get onto platforms and they will give information that seems to be divine but that information is actually being gathered from people's Facebook pages and online profiles. I know. It's tragic that that's even happening. It's the modern day, you know, I, I won't even mention that name even though he was exposed. I'll be merciful there. But there was an evangelist back in the day. He had an earpiece and his wife was feeding him information. And he was prophesying based upon prayer cards that people had filled out before the service. And so that's the modern day gimmick that some of these prophets are using. So be careful that what they're prophesying is accurate and be careful about the accurate information that they give. If what they're prophesying accurately is all found on your Facebook page, well then be very careful. So anyway, I'm talking about the true prophets. I'm talking about those who truly hear from God and I've known a few of them. I'm talking, we will go up to a complete stranger and he will give names, 
He will know what's going on in their life, not people reading, not looking at them and trying to find clues about their lives, which some people actually do. But a prophet is going to be able to do a couple of things. A prophet is going to be able to, number one, foretell the future. Acts chapter 11, verses 27 through 30 say, During this time, some prophets traveled from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them named Agabus stood up in one of the meetings and predicted by the Spirit that a great famine was coming upon the entire Roman world. This was fulfilled during the reign of Claudius. Verse 29, So the believers in Antioch decided to send relief to the brothers and sisters in Judea, everyone giving as much as they could. Verse 30, They did this, entrusting their gifts to Barnabas and Saul, to take to the elders of the church in Jerusalem. So prophets are given the oracles of God. Prophets can foretell the future. But prophets can also give you information. They can hear from God concerning the future and they can gather information that should not be known to them without divine communication. So I am not a prophet. I don't claim to flow in the, or function in the office of the prophet, but I do prophesy. I remember one time I was in a church service and I was praying over these people who were gathered at the altar. And I was just pacing slowly back and forth in front of the altar. Maybe you've seen me do it. And I was sensing like the, the, this surge that comes on me during these services. It was moving up and down my body. And I'm walking back and forth. And I hear something to the effect of, I don't remember exactly the phrase, but something like, I want to do that too. And I said, Lord, what was that? And I didn't recognize, it was just sounded odd. It was like, it was in my mind, but I can't explain how I heard it. It was just a different sense altogether. Try, try explaining hearing to someone who's never heard. Try explaining sight to someone who was born blind. You just can't explain a sense. In the same way, you can't explain a spirit sense. I can't explain how I knew. And, and that phrase, I want to do that too. I heard it, and then the Lord said, point that person out. And it was a boy about my age. I said, you, you just said in your heart, I want to do that too. And he was startled. He was terrified. What was interesting is that it took me a while to find that boy. It took me a while to find out why God had allowed me to hear that. This means that I heard that before the boy thought that. And I want you to think about that one. In other words, it was foretelling of the future and it was information I should not have known. He didn't write that on his Facebook. He thought it. And it came to me, the boy thinks it, I say it, and in that moment, God revealed his thought. I'm not saying I can read people's minds. I'm saying God can, and every so often he'll tell his prophets what he heard. So John chapter 4, verses 15 through 19, this is an encounter that Jesus is having with a woman at the well. She said, Please, sir, the woman said, Give me this water, then I'll never be thirsty again. And I won't have to come here to get water. Verse 16, go and get your husband, Jesus told her. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Jesus said, you're right, you don't have a husband. For you have had five husbands, and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. Now her response is very telling of the prophetic ministry. Verse 19, sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. In other words, prophets were known to reveal information that they should not have known otherwise. So prophets can predict the future by God's power. And well, let me put it this way. Prophets can hear God's guidance about the future. They themselves cannot see the future. And number two, prophets can hear information from God that they should not know without a divine connection. Now, there are different levels of prophecy. I'll give you just a few. This, these are not necessarily biblical, but these are what I've observed over the years about the prophetic ministry. There is personal prophecy. This is prophesying to the individual. There is corporate prophecy. This is prophesying to the body of Christ in a certain region, like a, a church. There is regional prophecy. This is prophesying over a city or a state. There is national prophecy, prophesying over a nation. And there is global prophecy, prophesying over the world. So God will give prophets information at different levels of influence. So I remember, many of you remember Prophet Kim Clement. And there, there's another one I was just talking about today. In fact, today I drove by, we were looking for some facilities for the, the ministry. And I drove by this church and I pointed to my friend. I said, look, in that parking lot right there, 
That's where Kim Clement and I stood talking in the parking lot. Now, you know, many of you know, Kim Clement has since then gone home to be with the Lord. Um, but, you know, I remember watching him and he would prophesy things on a national scale that would come to pass. So there are different levels of the office of the prophet. Well, I'm just going to recap now. There is the pastor, the apostle, the teacher, the evangelist, and the prophet. And that will do it for the lesson. I really enjoyed teaching that. I hope you enjoyed hearing that. I want to pray with you now. And be sure to tune in next week. I'll be talking about the power gifts. You're going to love that teaching. So I want to pray with you now. And let's believe that God will begin to use you. And if he's given you one of these gifts, that he'll begin to stir that in you now. Come on, put your hands toward mine in faith. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for that one who is receiving this prayer. And I ask you, precious Jesus, to cover them in your glory. Fill them fresh with your spirit, I pray. And I ask, Lord, that you would begin to stir that gift. Let a passion be kindled in their hearts. Let a fire be set ablaze within the soul. Guide them and direct them. Use them for your glory. In Jesus' name. There are prophets watching me. There are apostles watching me. There are pastors and teachers and evangelists watching me. Lord, raise them and use them for the glory of your son, Jesus. In that precious name we pray. And I want you to say it if you agree, say, Amen. Well, that is it for the lesson and the prayer. I'm going to read these comments now and stick around till after these comments. I want to talk to you about that fundraiser, how things are going. And in fact, I was today, if you're watching this on July 6, 2017, today I went out, Steve and I went looking for properties and we actually looked at one facility today. It may be the one, but keep us in prayer. We're still looking. Okay. I want to read your comments now. And these are from last week's lesson. This is the lesson I did on the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the introduction. So I hope you enjoyed that. It's my first time reading these. So here is the list of comments from last week. Isaiah Sineo writes, Thank you, Pastor David, for sharing the Word of God. I can feel the anointing every time I am watching your videos. God bless you more. Alicia Alexis writes, Stephen, your singing was absolutely flawless. Thank you, Brother David. I was looking forward to this message. Our Father is always on time. That's right. Don't forget to check out the playlist of Stephen Moctezuma. Some of the songs that are featured here are also put on that playlist, and some of the songs that are not featured here are also put on that playlist. So you might be able to get some uh, uh, different mix there. Reactor Guy writes, Thank you for this powerful message from God. I now realize that I have been given a spiritual gift too. Well, praise God. That's why we did it. I pray for you, the Encounter TV team, and the Spirit Church family. God bless your ministry. Well, God bless you for reacting, Reactor Guy. Pixie M writes, Stephen sang beautifully. I always look forward to his singing. So do I. He's actually my favorite worship leader. Edith writes, I have always felt the presence of the Lord while you are preaching. You are truly being used by God to minister to me. Thank you so much. May God bless. And finally, Caroline Jackson writes, Well, your videos are definitely God sent. You are 100% led by the Holy Spirit. I have been praying to God lately to know what my spiritual gift is, and I believe God will use you to show it to me and others that are seeking. God bless you and watch over you and your ministry. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Well, thank you for that encouraging comment, Caroline. In fact, on part four of this series, I'm going to be showing you from the Word of God how to find your spiritual gift, how to know for sure, without a doubt, that you have received a spiritual gift from the Lord. So tune into part four. You're going to want to see that. Also, don't forget to leave a comment on this video. If you're watching this on YouTube, we'd like you to participate in the comments. I want to know, what spiritual gifts do you think you have? Pastor, evangelist, prophet, teacher, apostle, if any, or perhaps one of the other gifts. Let me know. Write them in the comments. I want to read them. And let me know about the unique combinations that God has given you as far as spiritual gifts go. Well, I want to welcome now the new members of Spirit Church. There you are up on the screen. We love you. We are praying for you. I always say that because I always mean it. 
If you'd like information on how you can join the Spirit family, go to davidhernandezministries.com slash spiritchurch to join this community. It's an online Spirit Church community. And basically what you do is you'll receive an email every week from us with the teaching in it on Sunday mornings. You receive that teaching and you can even reply to that email for prayer support. If you join that, it's free and you'll be joining the membership with thousands from all around the world. Okay, I want to talk to you about something. Don't turn off this video. I need your help, okay? And I've always promised to be very honest with you about where the ministry is. And so I'm just going to tell you, the ministry is in a good season right now. And I want to season on the opportunity. We right now are in the middle of a campaign to raise our monthly support so that we can move in to a brand new ministry facility. And in that brand new ministry facility, we're going to do more production. We're going to do weekly meetings. We're going to be able to do live broadcasts from the studio. We're going to have a 24-7 prayer room. And also, in addition to that facility that we're going to get with the new monthly support, we're actually going to be able to begin doing more events with that monthly support. So here's what we needed. We needed a thousand new $30 a month partners for this overall ministry expansion. It's overall, it's facility and it's more events. That overall ministry expansion is what we needed and here's where we are. Look at how far we've come. We're almost there. I'm telling you, we can finish this up in just a matter of months. So how do you help with this campaign? Well, you, it's very simple. Sign up to become a $30 a month supporter. And again, this is gonna be for our new production facility and for the expansion of our events department so that we can do more events in more places, maybe even in your region. So you sign up to become a $30 a month partner and you stay with us, stay with me long term. Some of people have signed up and they've signed up for a lifelong commitment. They say, Brother David, I'm with you lifelong. Look, I'll make you this promise. I'll preach the gospel for the rest of my life. Just help me do it. Help me get the gospel all around the world. Sign up to become a $30 a month supporter today and as your free initiation thank you gift, I'll send you either Carriers of the Glory or 25 Truths About Demons and Spiritual Warfare. Those two books are those that are available from the ministry, and I'll send one of them to you signed when you become a $30 a month supporter. So do that today. We need just a couple hundred more to sign up for that, and then we're ready to take care of the monthly cost for our brand new facility. So do that today. At the, if you're watching this on YouTube at the end of the video, there's going to be a red link that appears. You can click that on your mobile phone or even on your desktop. It's clickable. Do it today. Sign up now. Become a $30 a month supporter. Help us take the gospel all around the world in the power of the Holy Spirit. Help us win souls. Well, that is it for this edition of Spirit Church. Until next time, remember, nothing is impossible with God. Thank you for watching Encounter TV. Don't forget to subscribe. Also, help me win souls by spreading the gospel through events and media. Make a one-time donation or become a monthly supporter by clicking on the donate link now.